and welcome to The Pod. I'm Nathan Fink. I'm Jasmine Torres-Allen, and this is New Hampshire Family Now. A show about building family in the Granite State. Today in the show, Jasmine bakes oversalted cookies. Waypoint ED Borja Alvarez de Toledo talks upstream thinking and youth engagement. And Kimball Jenkins' Julianne Godori discusses how arts bring out the humanity in all of us. New Hampshire Family Now is brought to you by the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. Since 1962, the Charitable Foundation has worked hand-in-hand with generous and visionary citizens to maximize the power of giving and support, collaborate, and lead innovative initiatives. Initiatives like New Hampshire Tomorrow, which is focused on making sure children and families have access to education, health care, and career pathways to ensure every family member thrives. To learn more about New Hampshire Charitable Foundation and all their initiatives, go to www. Dot nhcf.org. This podcast was also brought to you by Family Support New Hampshire. Family Support New Hampshire is NH's coalition of family resource centers and family strengthening programs that exist to ensure Granite State families have access to resources so both caregivers and children can succeed because supported families are strong families. To find a family resource center near you, visit www.fsnh.org. Let me just start the show and then we'll go and play. Is that okay? <laughs> Hello and welcome to the show. I am here as always with Jasmine Torres Allen. How you doing? I'm doing good. Yeah. You know, obviously Thanksgiving coming up. There's a lot of prep we gotta yeah, do. Yeah, I'm hosting Thanksgiving this year, so I'm excited. How many? Uh, at least twenty people. So twenty people. Yeah, I, this is my Super Bowl. I'm ready. Do you, do you know uh, one thing that I love Ooh. is that I get the I'm bored a lot, which drives me crazy. <laughs> but <laughs> I need some strategy. So yeah. this is. Why I, you know, and you. here are some things that I've been doing with my kids lately, and they're all good things that are great for memory and they're good for connection and, you know, creating art together. So, mm-hmm. like, we're having Thanksgiving right around the corner. Have your kids make placemats for Thanksgiving or maybe you put the papers out and you do tic-tac-toe games and you talk about what it's like to gather and include them in that process of, like, having people over. Like, hey, what do you think we should eat today? And it just starts to really open up different conversations with your kids and you're like wait I can just talk to them like regular people you know what I mean and you forget because you're like just going through life and you're used to just being around them and they're playing in their own you know like little thing but this is a great way to bring them in maybe make some art together make some fun little place cards or something like that that's I'm so glad you said that because this is about the space between you and that child where all of a sudden you're building this thing, but that thing gives you opportunities to actually connect. Yeah. And it also encourages you to put down your screens, you know, because I think as parents, sometimes we get so involved in what's happening around the world that it's okay to put the phone on the counter, on the side, leave it charging in another room. And and if you don't know how to play or maybe you're you're worried about creating art, find a coloring book that you guys might enjoy coloring together. Maybe it's Marvel coloring books that you can do together and start small. Don't do something that's wicked intimidating. That's a big craft. And maybe that requires a lot of pieces because then then you're like, you know what? I totally regret doing this. But just start small and get a coloring book. And, you know, they have one page and you have the other. Or maybe like you have them complete one side of the coloring page and you finish it off or, you know, vice versa, but start small. So that way you can create those small moments of connection because the more moments you have like that, the more they're going to crave. Well, connection and like for me, realizing that it's not about the thing you're creating. Mm -hmm. It's about the moment you're having because one, if you come in and my wife and I talk about this all the time, because you'll see like cookie baking fails with kids (laughs) all the time. What do you expect? (laughs) Right? Like you're not, it's not about the cookies. Yeah. It's not about the product. And I think that this is taking me a while to learn because I get jazzed on how things should be. Yes. Quote unquote. Especially when, like, it, when the activity is cooking with your child. Yeah. Right. Like sometimes you're like, oh, no, they put a lot of salt in there or, right. you know, because we're so focused on the outcome and making yeah. sure that it comes out perfect. But all they really care about is doing it with you. Doing it, right. That's it. My uh, wife got my son, a my youngest, a uh, kid's cooking kit. And I'll tell you, he uses cinnamon liberally. <laughs> Those must be some spicy. Cold. I didn't know cinnamon could burn like that. 
<laughs> but um, I think coming even back to art, culinary arts, obviously yeah. food and cooking, this isn't art, but the actual act of making something like painting, coloring and things, because I'm starting to learn when my kids do that, watching their mind interact with their experience. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. And you start to see their mood shift a little bit too, because they're getting to spend that time with you and they start to get a little more silly and they start to say things and you're like, oh, there's that personality right, right there. You right. start to kind of connect on that on a on a deeper level. And it also allows you to, you know, have conversations with them. You right. can start to ask those questions, right. you know, that I've talked about a million times. Right. Yeah. I love that. And, yeah. you know, we play this game called Animal Mashup where we take two animals and we I ask them to mash them up on the page. I love that. That's such a great idea. Yeah. And what is interesting about it is you can see what they prioritize. Yeah. What things about that animal rise to the yeah. surface and actually they draft. And it's that becomes you getting a peek at their worldview. Exactly. You know, and then it's the conversation of what didn't make the page mm -hmm. and why, because then they're starting to notice things. They're starting to think about the way they think, which man, if somebody did that when <laughs> I was a kid, I wouldn't be in this mess. Yeah. And I mean, even just doing that, you're building critical thinking skills that they're going to do on their own. And you've just given them the building blocks for yeah. it. From the NHPBS perspective, do you guys have any tools then to help families with this type of engagement? Absolutely. So obviously we're in Native American Heritage Month as well, and we're having a gathering and we can't deny the history behind our gatherings, right? Right. And so we have this great show that most kids love. It's called Molly of Denali. And Molly of Denali is a native Alaskan and she is amazing. And she has a game that we would like to recommend to teach kids on how to make lists for special gatherings. So um, Molly of Denali talks about her native gathering that she puts together and she creates a list and you help her build the list. And that's a great way to teach kids a little bit of responsibility, but also includes them in the whole gathering process. And that's nhpbs.org slash education. And when we come back, Borja joins us. Don't go anywhere. Today's episode was brought to you by Upreach Therapeutic Equestrian Center. Located in Goffstown, New Hampshire, Upreach partners with the power of horse to create strong children, strong families, and strong communities. To learn more about Upreach Therapeutic Equestrian Center and its many inspirational programs, visit UpreachTEC.org. That's UpreachTEC.org. Today's show was also brought to you by Burgu Media, a full-service media company dedicated to helping nonprofits realize impact stories for print, video, social and legacy media, and more. Both budget-conscious and grant-friendly, Burgu Media helps your organization celebrate the humans in human services. Learn more at burgumedia.com. Hello and welcome back to the podcast. I'm thrilled to welcome Borja Alvarez de Toledo, president and CEO of Waypoint, a strengthening family organization who empowers Granite Staters of all ages through an array of human services and advocacy work. Borja, welcome to the show. Thank you for having us and for featuring this very important work. Well, I appreciate you coming on. It feels like I've been wanting to have this conversation now for all of my time at the Children's Trust. But for those out there who don't know what or who Waypoint is, can you tell us a little bit about your service array? So Waypoint has been around for a long time, actually. We started in 1850, which makes us the oldest um, child-serving organization in New Hampshire. And what I'll tell you is that one of the things that's fairly unique about us is that we're statewide. So we cover pretty much the whole territory in New Hampshire. And we also cover all the stages of life. So we start in prenatal and early mm. childhood and go all the way to home care for seniors. The focus much more recently has been on prevention and really sort of, you know, factors that are going to help kids and family stay strong, learn, grow and develop in the community. And we're moving away from sort of the deep end services, which we used to provide and that we really want to move upstream and, and develop models and programs that support families when we first did that they need something. What do you think is leading that kind of pivot away from what you can call intervention services or more reactionary services toward this upstream mentality about preventing something that hasn't yet happened? So I think it's the, the understanding that what a problem presents itself is really the tip of the iceberg of many social determinants of health or 
any of the factors that are rooted in society, in inequities, in um, disadvantages, in neighborhoods where families grow. And if you don't take all of those factors into account, by the time a family shows up to you, it's very late. Mm -hmm. So there's much more of an understanding that true prevention happens early on. And there's an investment. New Hampshire has changed. Mm -hmm. They did not use to invest in prevention. It was like more like when there's a problem, we'll try to fix it. And I think there's been a lot of education by many agencies working to sort of say to the legislators, that's too late and it's actually more expensive. Why don't we actually build a better family life by having all of these services that we know are incredibly effective in building resiliency, right? What comes to mind for me is the idea of confronting change prior to issues. It requires a nimbleness of culture of perspective. And you kind of hearken to this about learnings, right? The state is learning. But on the organizational level, when you say pivot, it feels to me like a struggle. How does an organization like Waypoint then pivot from something as concrete as a cultural perspective? We intervene when problems happen to, wait a minute, let's think upstream prior to that. So it's a great question. Let me, so some of how we do this is certainly through conversations, is certainly through training, but it's also by looking at outcomes. You know, when we talk about federal programs that are sort of saying that prevention models are ones that you can fund to avoid foster care placement, preventing a really difficult outcome is not real prevention. Right. It's too late, right? right? So there's been a sort of a, a, a movement at the federal level and a movement at the state level. And I think it requires conversations, training, and the flexibility of our staff to say like, you know what? We can make a difference that makes a difference, right. a much deeper difference than what we're doing right now, where we're patching a whole history of events that have been very difficult for families. That requires an investment in community, in bettering community. So your perspective then has to kind of align. Absolutely. And what it actually means is the understanding that our program or our model is not enough. You have to do it in collaboration with many other systems. We need to talk to housing, you know, to talk to public health. You need to talk to all those systems. And I think the battle that we have is what I call the glue, is the glue between the systems is not cheap. You have to invest in that connective tissue to make sure that everybody's working together with the families that are actually being touched by many systems. Right. And if the systems are not coordinated and working together, it's not really an efficient way to work. No, it's not human, right? It's not, I don't think of my day as going from system to system. I think of us as ping ponging between them. Absolutely. It's with like one single door, no wrong door. And that's the way we should access systems. So we don't pretend to do everything. And our family resource centers are a very good example. We do provide some services, but what we know is to where to access the ones we don't give. And we actually facilitate that connection to another service that might be provided by another agency. That to me is where the solution is. Now in this conversation too, it, it makes me think that doesn't excuse you from the problem itself. Ignoring, we're not ignoring if a problem presents that you're going to say, well, well, we can't think about that because that's downstream, right? We've got to think about what's in front of us and then have that courage to kind of walk back upstream and say, okay, what is preventing us from a better way? And I'm thinking about this now because I had the luxury of visiting your Manchester Youth Resource Center and your overnight emergency shelter. And you're doing this great work painting a mural on the side. And I know that youth center opened up about a year ago. And so I want to step back and say, okay, in light of the fact that we're talking about preventative services upstream, what became evident in the community that you still had to open up that intervention-like access for this community? <laughs> So um, when we in have conversations internally about how we want our services for youth that experience homelessness to be is we don't want to have services. So we want, you know, functionally zero um, homelessness in the youth population. We also understand that they're sort of the invisible youth that are very good at hiding themselves because of trauma and many other reasons they've been sort of failed by the system. Mm. And they're here. So our hope is let's serve them now with what we know is needed today, but really with the eyes in how can we prevent this and start moving upstream also in those services. So New Hampshire is the only state in New England that did not have a shelter for um, youth experiencing homelessness. And one of the things we know in the research is pretty clear that you don't want to put those youth in an adult system, an adult shelter, because the minute they entered that system, what happens is their dreams of having any sense of hope completely shattered, right? It's like, this is me in 25 years. So the models are pretty clear. Is like, 
don't enter them into that system. And we didn't have one. And we said, we have to build one. And hopefully in five years, we'll have this conversation. And I'll say, you know what, Nathan, we don't need a shelter anymore. That'll be a great victory. But right now it is responding to the needs today of the population that we serve. Yeah. Now we started this conversation with the non-humanness of systems, right? These are structures that are set up that are usher us through different things we hope to either avoid gain along the way. But I'm pleased because because I visited the emergency shelter a couple of weeks ago and I saw that you were creating a mural on the side. Tell me what inspired that type of work. Why do that? So you write that when we look at the places where we're going to serve uh, people we work with, we have the privilege of serving, right? We want to make sure that it's the right environment. That's an environment that feels like a community, that's inviting, that especially for youth that have no homes and oftentimes sleep in their cars, something that is um, that feels like a living room. And if you've been there, you know that they sit around TV and watch TV, which is a very normalizing thing to do. And they don't get to do that. So we also knew that there's some young people who've, and and I would say that 95% of the youth we serve um, have experienced some level of trauma, right? And one of the ways in which a trauma gets to be expressed and resolved is through art and through nonverbal forms. So we knew we wanted to partner with, uh, in this case, Kimball Jenkins, which is a great art school in Concord. And we applied for a a, a resident uh, program so that we had someone come and help some of our youth explore art and start sort of developing artistic things. Out of that, they saw the the wall outside that is just a brick wall. And they said, you know, we also do murals. And our youth were like, can we do that? And we actually applied for a grant and we got a grant through the, uh, count, the New Hampshire Council on Arts to support the project. Because one of the things that we wanted to make clear is if we're making a youth work on this mural, they need to get paid. Mm. This is their experience of being professionals. And what is really exciting about this project is that it's been basically three months of planning. And this is not someone from Kimball Jenkins that designed. This is a co-design with all of the youth that were in the program. So they are the ones who had the vision, who had the language that's going to go in the mural, and they actually built it, prepared it, and painted it. V? Yeah. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. So tell me, what what is this project? It's a big project. It's all collaborative art pieces. These art, This art was submitted by individuals? Yep. I'm Nathan, by the way. Wow, that's my name, too. Is it really? What's your favorite part of it so far? Personally, my favorite element is Polo the dinosaur. So I was trying to learn how to draw with my right hand because I've been an artist my entire life. So I drew this little yellow guy and his best friend is a mushroom dinosaur, Polo. I'm Mickey. Mickey, nice yes. to meet you. Nice to meet you. So what, what's it like to work on a project like oh, this? Oh, it's... it's um, it's uh, stressfully for me. I love art. It's like a wusa, like a kosher. Like a, yeah. It puts me in a, a mellow space. It's a comfortable, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. When I'm painting, my mind's just free and I'm just enjoying myself. And, and like I said, I live in this neighborhood, so I like to look, I like. I want the neighborhood to look clean and nice, you know what I'm saying? So I love, I, I probably walk by here every day and I, I would love to look at this. Not only <laughs> just look at it, just knowing like, hey, I, I had a part of that. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the the whole idea is how can this be sort of an example and transformative for the community? Mm-hmm. I just want people, when they drive down Hanover Street, to just look to the right and to see the mural and just see not just the art of it, but what's behind that art. And it's the voices of many youth in a collaborative process. Borja, it's been an absolute pleasure. I can't believe it took us this long to chat. Thank you for coming on the show. I'm glad it happened. Thank you, Nathan. To learn more about Waypoint and all their service offerings, visit waypointnh.org. That's waypointnh.org. And when we come back, Julianne Godori joins us. Don't go anywhere. This podcast was brought to you by Nixon Peabody, who delivers exceptional legal services for clients in the community by combining high performance, an entrepreneurial spirit, deep engagement, and an unwavering commitment to a culture of collaboration, diversity, and humanity. Nixon Peabody works with universities, hospitals, and nonprofits of every size to maximize impact. For more information, visit nixonpeabody.com. Many thanks to New Hampshire's Office of Social and Emotional Wellness for sponsoring this podcast. Started within New Hampshire's Department of Education, the Office of Social and Emotional Wellness consolidates policy development and implements projects and programs that are focused on health and wellness with an emphasis on behavioral health of all students, youth, and families. To learn more about the Department of Education and its many programs and approaches, visit www.education.nh.gov. 
Hello and welcome back to the podcast. I'm excited to welcome Julianne Godori, Executive Director of Kimball Jenkins, a community cultural center whose mission is to cultivate creativity and make arts education accessible. Julianne, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's been a while. I've been wanting to talk with you because I'm so thrilled at all the work that you did for us at the Children's Trust and the installation piece you built for us. So I wanted to start with an easy question. What is it about art that is essential to the human experience? Yeah, that's a easy. super easy question. Easy. <laughs> so what I always tell people, because when they are talking about art and their immediate thing is I'm not artistic. And I say, well, everyone's artistic. Everyone's creative. Is that the arts are all around us all the time, every single day. The arts, I am convinced, are something that everyone does and everyone engages with. Mm -hmm. Everything around you is designed. And when you see color, when you see design, mm -hmm. when you see intention that humans have invested in something, whether it's cooking or landscaping or gardening or the music that is being played or, you know, that feeling that you just have to like move and dance to, mm -hmm. that's human intentionality. Humans are choosing their creative choices and putting them into what is created. Mm -hmm. And you can tell the difference between something that has that spark of joy, whether it's aesthetics or music or dancing or even in theater, you can tell that you can see the humanity through all those things. When we talk about it this way, it feels like we are actually talking about human connection, but a human connection that transcends time. Definitely. Like it is communicating something to us and enriching our lives as we go. Yeah, I like that you brought up the time piece because, you know, we can study the contextual reasons why people of a certain era may have designed art deco houses or why the Greeks may have done certain pottery a certain way or whether it's aesthetics or functional or materials. But all of those contextual things tell us about those people, but it also connects us as humans because we can see those choices right. that were brought to life. And those choices then also tell you something about the circumstances they were in, in their own communities at the yes. time. Yeah. So that makes me want to ask if that's the case, then these choices are changing over time continuously. And there, I, I feel like there's something happening in cities here in New Hampshire. There's something happening with regards to the arts. What are we seeing that is kind of giving us a rise to this kind of artistic expression in our cities here? Yeah, I think in New Hampshire in general, we are seeing a bit of a renaissance. I think we are going from a place where, you know, people often joked that young people were our greatest export. And now we want to be a place where we want people of all ages, of all backgrounds, people who have families, who don't have families, all different kinds of people to live and thrive here. And we've got amazing quality of life and amazing resources mm -hmm. in order to really, truly attract people to move here and also have the people who are already living here stay here. Uh, we really need to, you know, up our game in terms of cultural opportunities, in terms of food, in terms of who we are including in decision making and right. opportunities for engagement. Uh, I see the arts are really being used as a vehicle to engage all different populations and have it be more of a participatory thing. So you can go to that art event, you can go to that concert, you can contribute to that community discussion mm -hmm. that is going to have some policy discussion outcomes. But in that process, you might arrive at those policy uh, recommendations through the creation of a facilitated art project. You might feel more connected to something because of, again, that human choice and that human intentionality of mm -hmm. I am contributing to something. Yeah, it makes it impossible to ignore the voice, I think, on the ground because you can see it, you can yeah. feel it, you can taste it. And I think a lot of times what happens in our cities, in our systems, that we forget that this is by humans for humans mm -hmm. and art kind of brings that crashing to the surface. So I want to talk then about you personally. How do you arrive at this work? Again, another easy question. Yeah, yeah. two in a row. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I have just always been one of those people who have been very drawn to making, um, making things. I've always sewn my own clothes, done paper mache. I enjoy cooking and 
the skill that comes with repetitive action of something has always been something I've been really drawn to. I love knitting and things that, again, have that um, repetition. So I came to Kimball Jenkins because I was fortunate to work at the state level, uh, working with lots of nonprofits around the state who are doing arts education. And I was also working uh, at the national level. And I got the opportunity to see a lot of just really incredible community arts examples happening throughout the country. And I was just like, you know, I want this here in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And I had already seen great examples of it happening in New Hampshire. But when the opportunity to help lead the new direction for Kimball Jenkins came up, I was like, this really could be a community resource that could lead some of these participatory community based experiences through the arts and history and culture. So functionally speaking, then as an organization, how does Kimball Jenkins go about achieving that? Yeah. So the Waypoint mural is a really great example. We have partnered with Waypoint um, and that has been uh, led by our programming director, Yasemin Safarzadeh. She was the artist in residence at Waypoint Youth Resource Shelter. So Yasemin goes by Yaz and Yaz was going there weekly and facilitating art making experiences. And that transition to Kimball Jenkins being involved and when you go to the re- the center, there's a ton of young people all around. Mm-hmm. Waypoint has done an excellent job of making this like a place that truly feels like these people want to hang out at. And there is, you know, 30 young people playing video games or reading or using the computers, cooking food, being with each other in a safe space. So when we're facilitating art making activities, we're helping to enrich those offerings. We are a consistent adult presence that comes and we're building a relationship with them and we're showing them that they can have these fun experiences, make things that they might be proud of and maybe pull them out of temporarily the very real crises and um, struggles that they're in when trying to access housing, you know, not having enough financial resources, food, all of the things you can think of. A lot of the young people that we work with are just so creative and funny and talented, and they're just in a tough spot, which everybody experiences at a different time in their life. So the mural that this was an opportunity for us to work with them on a big project, which has a lot of value to show that you can contribute to something that is mm-hmm. larger than yourself. So if you don't have consistent anything in your life, but yet you're going to consistently show up and contribute to something that is going to change the the built environment around you, that's really powerful. Mm-hmm. It makes sense. Over time is if you can actually see your participation as being evident and beneficial, you gain investment. And I'm certain that people want to know more. So if you do, where can we go? Yeah, I'd love to say follow us on our website, which is KimballJenkins.com. Follow us on social media and come to our events like follow us, figure out when things are happening. Come and introduce yourself. Just say, hey, this is what I'm into. Come learn more about what we're doing and maybe get involved in different ways. Um, If you're in a position that you can support having art space facilitated activities, we'd love to have a conversation with you. And I think also we just really want to encourage everyone to notice the role that the arts and culture play in your everyday lives. And once you start being a little bit more tuned into those expressions of humanity and noticing that, I really do feel like there is a joyful connection that happens that you're appreciating all of this humanity around you. Julianne, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much. Yeah. Many thanks to the Samuel P. Hunt Foundation for sponsoring this podcast. Established in 1951, Samuel P. Hunt Foundation is a Manchester-based, independent nonprofit that provides grants primarily for the arts, children and youth services, faith-based organizations, educational institutions, healthcare, and human services. New Hampshire Family Now is listed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and more. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or ask your smart speaker to play New Hampshire family now. 